fallback and receive. Now these two functions can be implemented to cater for kind of the last edge case. What happens if we call a function on a contract and it doesn't match any signatures, then it will default to a fallback function if data was provided. If there was no data provided, then the receive function will be activated. And we'll talk about this call data uh, that we're going to send in just a moment. But just understand, usually as a developer, you need to kind of cater for this um, to be able to withdraw the funds like we've seen in the previous uh, video. But sometimes that's not possible. So these functions will be used to kind of log data um, and it can refund someone. But keep in mind that these functions only have access to like 2,300 units of gas. So barely enough uh, to do a send or a transfer function like we've seen before. However, they are great for logging too. So to see what's happening in the contract. And we know that a fallback uh, function will kick off when there's some call data that's being sent and we can't find a signature match for a method, meaning that the user is trying to call something on the contract that's not existing. And then for sending simple ether, if someone accidentally sends some ether to the contract, the receive function uh, will kick off if there is no call data. But let's see this in action. So before we start, let's just get rid of these commented kind of ways of transferring from the previous video. And now what I'll do is I'll add these two functions, the fallback function and the receive function. Now, like I said, in here, we can decide to emit an event or do something interesting. For now, I'll show you how we can check and verify if these are going to be called. But essentially what we are waiting for is that if we send some call data that doesn't match any of our functions, uh, we expect this fallback function to be called. And if we send some ether without any call data, that means that the receive function should be called. So let's test that out. Now deploying the contract, let's just refresh our minds on call data. Essentially, we provide the hex of the function and the data that we want to call on this contract in here as a hex value. How do we know what function we should call? Well, a function signature or the selector, I would say that we need to use in the hex is made up of the name of the function and all the parameter types without spaces as a string. It is then kind of hashed and the first four bytes is taken as the call data uh, to know what function we want to call. Now, in order to spoof this and kind of make sure that no function exists, I'm just going to simply um, give the hex value of that, of place. And I know that's not going to exist at all because it's not even hashed, but I'm going to provide this anyway down here. So what will happen if we say transact? I'm going to click on this and to our surprise, we see that this fallback function over here in the brackets was called. And that is as expected. We didn't send some ether. Um, and even if we did, but we provided callback, this should also be kicked off. Let's just test it out. I'm going to send one ether to the contract and call this. And indeed we do. We send one ether. Here it is as well. And the callback was called because we have some data or callback or call data, I should say, that doesn't match. There is no function it can call. So it defaulted to this fallback function over here that we've implemented, although it doesn't do anything. But like I said, you can log some stuff, maybe try and send the ether back, whatever you want to try in here. Keep in mind that these functions are restricted, like I said, to 2300 gas units. So it is very restrictive. On the other hand, though, if we send some ether again to the contract, maybe one ether, and this time we just simply don't send any call data with that and we just say transact, we can see that the receive function in this case over here was activated and called. So this is just a high level explanation of why and how these two functions will be called. Um, it's totally dependent up to you on how to implement these. I personally will use them for logging. You of course cannot control who sends Ether to a contract, and certainly it's not your responsibility to kind of make sure that they get a refund 
for accidentally doing so. However, you can kind of notify uh, in the contract that this kind of happened and maybe resolve it in some nice way. However, I feel it's very important to make sure that you have the withdrawal function definitely in some contracts for if this did occur, you could maybe withdraw the ether and send it back to the person uh, off the chain. Okay, and that is it for fallback and receive.